recording. Sorry about that. Let's try that again. All right. So this is being recorded for future students who weren't able to join us so that they can have this information um, later on. The other thing too is for um, mic purposes and things like that, no background noise, let's go ahead and um, stay muted. And then later, if you have any questions, you can unmute yourself later. Um, we can use also the chat uh, later on. I won't be able to see it when I'm on my screen share, but if Bex or Cherie or Jim can let me know if there's a question, that'd be great. Um, and yeah, let's just have a great time. So thank you for joining me tonight for this uh, special workshop of mine. Um, and so the title for this is How a CSU Commuter Student Found Her Place in the World. So this is for me. I, I am a graduate of the CSU system twice. I graduated from Cal State Long Beach um, and I lived locally. So I commuted every day in um, undergrad and in my master's. And in, the le in, in thinking about this presentation um, and where I've been and how I've been on my journey, I've come to identify some certain key lessons that I have figured out for myself um, that help me do something really important that I think is very important that a lot of people know how to do, which is understand, so create, own, and tell their narrative. So that's the purpose of this presentation. And so, um, like I said, my name is Eileen Vickery. I'm one of the advisors in the Study Abroad and Global Engagement Office, which we are now um, lovingly calling SAGE. And I'm also this uh, fall semester University 100 instructor. And so um, how it came to be that I'm doing this presentation is that it was actually, I believe uh, for Tracy, part of Major Mondays, um, a series that originated with housing and um, residential engagement and the Office of First Year Experience. So they actually were looking for people to talk about their journey and their past to how they ended up in their um, careers and positions. And so I signed up and I thought it would be great. I asked Tracy if I could actually have Monday, this day, um, at the start of International Education Week, because my story is a product of international education. So I just want to give a special thank to, thanks to OFYE and Housing and Residential Engagement, especially to Dimitri and to Tracy for giving me this opportunity to talk, to share my story with everybody. And so for the students that are joining um, today, you know, this isn't necessarily going to be a presentation about, you know, what I did with an English major or how to be, you know, what is the path to be a study abroad advisor and things like that. These are just general themes and observations that I made about my life. I'm a very reflective, introspective type of person. And so I'm hoping that for the students, this will help you on your own paths as you navigate and explore your own majors. Um, some prof beginning professional development advice, especially for the seniors getting ready to graduate, but also for all of us um, in how to feel comfortable and willing to tell our own stories. And so one thing that as I was creating this presentation for today that I kind of want to remind and point out to people is that as I went through all of this, I never knew what my life was going to look like. None of us do, but the power of narrative is, 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 is so powerful that it looks like it was almost done on purpose, like somebody kind of wrote it, but it's in the end, the way that you tell it. So hopefully this will be a fun uh, journey to share with everybody. So I'd like to kind of begin by saying that, you know, I identify as a Filipino American. Um, my parents, they both immigrated to the United States in the 1980s when they were in their early to mid 20s. And they eventually made their home in uh, Carson, California. And I don't know if anyone's familiar with where Carson is. It's kind of in the region known as the South Bay area. It's kind of nestled between Lomita and Torrance and Long Beach and, and Dominguez Hills and places like that. And um, I actually enjoyed growing up in Carson. Um, I thought it was great. Um, and one of the things that I realized why I liked it so much, especially growing up, was because of the community or the environment and the friends that I had. So something interesting, I mean, I grew up there in the 90s, but I looked at the 2010 um, census and the population and the demographics of Carson, California. And I thought it was really interesting because if you look at it, it's 28.5% white, 
23.5% Black or African American, 28.2% Asian Pacific Islander, and 38.8% Hispanic. That's almost kind of like nice and evenly distrib distributed, almost in a way that I haven't seen anywhere else. So I really enjoyed that upbringing, and I think it has a lot to do with some of the choices and, and the kind of attitudes and, and um, how I chose to kind of live and um, progress in my life. And so growing up in um, this great location for me, you know, I did a lot of things. I was interested in a lot of toys and I played with a lot of different things, but there was one thing that my mind always came back to, which was the world. And so these were the kind of things that filled my head as a little girl when I was growing up um, in our little, in our household where it wasn't just my nuclear family. We had my uncles living with us, my grandmother, sometimes people who were visiting from the Philippines would crash at our place. So I had a very lively home. And every year we watched a lot of TV, but we always enjoyed watching the Miss Universe pageant and uh, make what you will of, you know, gender norming and things like that. But for me, I really enjoyed watching the Miss Universe pageants because I thought even at a young age, it was amazing to see, that's probably how I learned to read. I would read the sashes on, on, on the ladies in all of these different countries. And I was like, wow, there's so many different countries out there. And they were all speaking in different languages. And I loved watching the national costume pageant. I was like, this is amazing. And I think from that, my mom later on got me these Barbie dolls that were from like different countries of the world. So I had those, those were the dolls that I actually played with the most. And then also in my childhood, I was a huge fan of where on the earth is Carmen Sandiego, the old computer game, the game show. Some people don't even realize it was a game show before where the contestants had to run around an unmarked map and identify all of the different countries. Um, and then when it was a 90s computer, uh, sorry, a 90s cartoon. Later on, I actually played around with the idea that I would write a script for the movie and have like Angelina Jolie play Carmen Sandiego. And I was like, oh, I should be the like best fit. And so I was really obsessed with the world. And then later on, when Japanese anime and Sailor Moon came into my life, I was like, oh, game over. Like, I'm not being productive. This is all I want to watch. So I was always interested in culture and what was out there. Fast forward a little bit to my first semester of college, I actually started off college with two part time jobs. I, um, in my the summer before I started college, I applied for uh, to work at Zany Brainy. It's a store that no longer is around. Um, it went bankrupt in like 2003. So I guess one year after I started working there, but it was basically an educational toy store. It was very lively. Um, they sold lots of different things. And on top of that, I was also a local um, tutor in my neighborhood. And so what these kind of things have in connection with each other is that at first when I started becoming a tutor, it was because um, someone in the neighborhood had asked me to said, hey, Butch isn't doing so well, can you help him? And so I did. And then later he was doing so well that someone, another neighbor said, can you, can you help Rihanna? And I said, okay. So I was tutoring about two to four kids on top of going to school and going to Zany Brainy. And I would actually use the discount that I got at Zany Brainy to buy things like workbooks for the kids and art supplies and all of these other fun things, stickers. And it wasn't until my mom told, I think Butch's mom, you know, they were having a conversation in Tagalog and I heard her say, Eileen's really good with kids. Like they listened to her and that stuck with me for a bit. I was like, huh. Yeah. And so I actually have, and I kind of still do with some kids, not my own, um, but you know, sometimes kids listen to me like I'm the Pied Piper. It's great. I would sometimes my family would joke around that they would just rather hire me for our children's parties because I would play games and things like that with them. And so this brings us to kind of lesson number one for me, which is pay attention to the things that interest you and what you're naturally pretty good at because for me the world teaching mm, they kind of come together that way and I didn't know it at the time the second thing that I kind of want to talk about is I kind of want to introduce some people on the screen so I'll start with the Arias family to the left right over here um, the Arias family is a family that I actually grew up 
hanging out with. My mother and uh, and uh, the mother, May Ar Arias, they worked together. And so we spent years going to holiday parties together, barbecues, picnics. But there was one person who I actually didn't see as much. And that's the woman over here in the blue. Her name is Gigi. And the reason why I actually didn't see her very much is because she lived in Japan with her husband, who was teaching English on what's called the JET program. And so I originally was introduced to this idea that you could do that at the age of 12 or 13. It was just like, a, oh, okay, someone's doing that. And they talked about his major, which was, or it was either his major or her major, which was English. And someone said, you know, you can do a lot of things with English. So that was kind of tucked away in the back of my mind. So I grew up with them. This next picture to the side is Bill Wolfenbarger. Mr. Wolfenbarger was my teacher in high school. I took geography with him and I took anthropology with him. And he was hands down, and there's, very, there's many of them, um, one of the teachers who had a really big impact in my life. Because when you're teaching geography and anthropology, it can be really dry, but because Mr. Wolfenbarger had traveled so much, he was able to kind of put examples and stories and make these things fun. So he would talk about running with the bulls and he would talk about posing and, and put, pushing up the uh, Leaning Tower of Pisa and all of these really great adventures that made it really come to life. And so there might've been kids in the back that really weren't paying attention, but I was always in the front just wanting to hear more. Um, and so then after that, after I graduated from high school, I started college at Cal State Long Beach in the fall of 2002. And in my, at the time, orientation class, a woman came in who just kind of busted into the door and asked the uh, class, she said, is anybody in here interested in studying abroad? And I didn't even know what that was yet. I, I don't, I think maybe two or three of us said, yeah, sure. I think I raised my hand because I was like, I'll see what this is. I don't know. And so she said, follow me. And so she took us out of our orientation and put us in a group with about 20 other students that she was able to recruit that said, okay, so we're going to be in this pilot program and we're going to offer you GEs that are specially designed with global themes to see if it's going to help you or, you know, help support you to study abroad. And so that's kind of how that came about. Um, at the time, to be honest, I was paying for college myself. I always tell my students that, you know, my mom made a little bit more and I, I could never qualify for grants. And at the time I was always told that, you know, you're not gonna get a scholarship. So I just, I did the, I paid for college the hard way. I worked every day. And so I thought I wasn't gonna be able to study abroad, but since I like the world so much, I'll just take the classes. And then, uh, so I started college and I actually started college as a film and electronics arts major because I really liked theater in high school. And I thought, so going back to the whole Carmen Sandiego and, and writing a script and things like that, I thought I was gonna go into production or something like that. But in my first semester of college, I took English 250A. So I had some AP credits and I was able to take English 250A with Dr. Martine Van Elk. And the first class, the first week that I had with her, she was amazing. She was so passionate about British literature that I decided that week to change my major. And I remember when I did that, our books at the time, the textbooks had like the CDs in the back. So I put the CD in my boom box and I was listening to this really ancient reading of Beowulf. And I was like, this is great. And my mom's like, what are you doing? And so that's how I actually ended up changing my major. And all of these folks in my life kind of were connected in that way to what I ended up doing now. So for me, lesson number two became pay attention to the people who have an influence on you. Um, you never know what ideas, what paths that you're going to discover, that their passion for things are going to be infectious and might want to um, you know, influence you in a particular way. And so that was that. So for lesson number three, I'm going to talk a little bit about what the path kind of looked like. So 
I know I said to myself that I wasn't going to study abroad, but in my sophomore year, as I was walking from my car to class, it was a really long walk, um, I decided, you know what, I'm going to study abroad because my really close group of friends in high school one went to study away in Cincinnati, one was dorming over at USC, one was dorming in Santa Cruz, and one was dorming in um, San Diego. And I was going back and forth. And at first, I was kind of fine with that. I was like, you know, it's close by, I'm just going to get my degree, I'm going to go. But I was like, I want to do something special with my If I can at least do one thing, I may not join a sorority. I may not do these other things, but there's something that I can do. And so since I had changed my major to English, one of the classes I had to take was Shakespeare. And I said, well, why don't I just take Shakespeare abroad? I, I think I can do that. So I went back to Sharon and I said, hey, Sharon, I think I'm going to do it. I think I'm going to study abroad. She went, great. And so she kind of helped me set that up. So I picked, you know, I saved certain classes that I needed. I, I made arrangements and I worked and it was still kind of pricey then. So when, you know, Zany Brainy went bankrupt, I had to find a new job. And I said, you know, I'll, and again, still, I wasn't thinking about things like scholarships. And so I said, you know, I'll be a waitress. I'll, I'll make tips. I'll, I'll do that. I'll put my nose to the grindstone and that's what I'm going to do. So that's the goal that I set for myself. Okay, this is my goal. This is what I'm going to do. And I'm going to do everything I can to save for it. And I remember, so I worked at Benihana. So that was a really hard job. I got burned all the time on that grill. Um, and I smelled like smoke every night. But when you want something so bad, you're willing to put up for, with so much to, to try and get it. And I remember, I think on my break, because it was really close to the mall, I went over to the mall and I passed by some shoes that I really, really liked. And I was holding them and they weren't that expensive, but I was kind of like, ooh, I want these. But then I was like, but I really want to go to London too. And I remember having this moment holding them and I go, you know what? I can buy shoes in London and I put them back and I was so proud of myself for that moment. So I set a goal, I was working towards it and I learned how to be organized because when you're applying for things, making sure you're on top of deadlines, these were the skills that I was already learning when I was applying to study abroad and it was great. And I had a wonderful time. I took Shakespeare. I actually got to stand on the Globe Theater and that for me at the time was a dream come true. I took other classes and I got to travel to so many other countries and learn additional skills. So then I came back and worked to finish my degree. And at that point I was like, well, what's next after that? What am I gonna do? Well, I knew that I wanted to be a high school English teacher, but I felt that I wanted to be the kind of teacher that Mr. Wolfenbarger was. I want to have examples. I want to help the, the content light up for students when I talk about it. And so, and the other thing too, was that I was becoming aware of inequalities in education and how, you know, not everybody comes from a primarily English speaking household. So I wanted to know what was that like? Like, what is it like to teach somebody whose first language isn't English? And so I was like, you know, Jet, okay, you know, um, Gigi Arias was able to, do, I'll do it. So then I applied for Jet. Um, I applied for it. And I remember that I got waitlisted. So that was pretty hard because in Benihana, you know, a lot of people who know people who've done JET and they go, you got waitlisted? It, it's kind of easy to get in. So I, I had these conflicting messages of like, is it competitive? Is it easy? But I was waitlisted. So there, most people go on JET in the summer. So August, September, I wasn't hearing anything back. So I was like, okay, I wasn't picked. Um, let me try again. I'll apply again and I'll do better this time. Well, in mid-October, I got an email and I think other people did too that said, anybody still wanna go to Japan? And I said, uh, yes. And so I replied back, I said, yes. And so that person at the time who worked, I think at the Japanese consulate for Jet was like, great. Okay, you're going in like two weeks what? <laughs> where am I going? I don't even know where. He's like, we'll tell you your, your location later, but you're leaving in two weeks. So I told my mom, uh, actually, they selected me. I'm going to Japan and I have two weeks. My poor mom, the things that I kind of put her through and she was, she went, okay. And so I graduated, you know, that 20, uh, 2007. And because what happened was 
a jet broke contract. She actually didn't want to be there anymore. And so she had decided to leave early September. So they were looking for somebody October and I didn't arrive until I think like Thanksgiving week of, so like almost like around this time in Japan. And so that's what I did. And so I took over. I didn't have an orientation. Everyone else got the orientations in the summer. I kind of had to figure things out on my own and I didn't get officially oriented until a year later. Um, and so I had to work to kind of put pieces of things together myself. Um, I knew that I was really hardworking. And at the time, teaching English in Japan can be a mixed bag. Um, at the time over there, you know, they had a textbook and, and they were just kind of like, can you do this? But I kind of wanted to do more. I wanted to understand, like, where are they? What are they doing? So I remember one year, probably my second or third year, I asked all my JET friends, I'm like, can I borrow your textbook? Can I borrow your textbook? We all have different textbooks. Can I borrow your textbook? And I went through all of them. And I tried to find patterns of what are we all learning? What, what's going on here? So I, I learned that in the first year of teaching junior high, all the students are learning descriptive words red colors weather age you know things and in the second year you know they're learning how to express opinion i like this i don't like this i think that and so on and so on and so i didn't know it at the time but that's those were kind of like the skills that a researcher would kind of do but i didn't know it at the time and then so fast forward a few years i stayed there for almost about five years that i was burnt out coming back and it was the middle of the recession and I was reaching out to to fellow teachers about how to actually, you know, get my credentials and be a teacher in California. And a lot of people were like, don't do it. We're all losing our jobs. Do something else. And I said, OK, well, cue period of uncertainty, because I definitely was burned out from teaching in Japan a lot. And for the first time, I didn't know what to do. I spiraled into depression. I I had always based my identity off of like, this is what I'm going to do. I said I was going to teach English and uh, teach high school English after Japan. And now that's not happening. What am I supposed to do? And then I had lunch with a friend from Benihana who we got to catch up again. And she was pretty awesome. She said, you know, if money weren't a thing, what would you want to do with your day? And I had to spend a week thinking about that. And the funny thing is that answer is not re really related to what I do now, but I told her that, you know, on JET, you know, every year people come and people go. And I really like introducing the new JETs to like what life in Japan is like. And I really feel that fulfillment when they leave and they go off onto their, their new things. And I said, maybe study abroad is kind of like that. And so I reached out again to my good old friend, Sharon. And I said, hey, Sharon, remember me? She said, of course. And I said, you know, I think I think I kind of want to see what the study abroad field is like. How do I get in? And she said, do you want to volunteer in our office? So she let me volunteer. So that's actually probably a lesson in there somewhere is don't underestimate the value of being able to volunteer and put your foot in the door. And so when she asked me to volunteer, the very first thing I got to volunteer for was at that time, Cal State Fullerton's International Education Week. So that's why International Education Week is a very special place in my heart because that was the first time I realized that this was the field that I wanted to be in. There were booths and performances and lectures and I thought it was such a great experience. And so that's how I found out that that's what I wanted to do. And so as I was researching, okay, now how do I actually get into study abroad? You know, I just, I Googled. <laughs> and so they said, you know, you need a master's. And I said, okay, well, what kind of master's? And I remember this website that said, you know, most people will probably get things, um, master's in things like international studies or global studies and things like that. And so nine out of 10 said international studies. There was one post that said, or you could do a higher ed degree because you know you'll need to know how things like financial aid works and and you know about students and how higher ed works in general i said that one makes sense i'll do that one and so i told sharon that i wanted to apply for um, a graduate degree in higher ed and i when i googled it i was like oh cool cal state fullerton has one it's the master's of science in higher education program she said we have one too and I said, oh, I didn't find it. Like, it's called something weird. And I said, OK, so she showed me the actual name of the degree. And it was something weird. You wouldn't think necessarily higher education with that particular um, degree. And then they renamed it later on. But it turned out I had two weeks, two weeks to submit this graduate degree, a, a graduate application. And I got it in. I got an interview. And then again, I was waitlisted. 
And so I was just, I'd been waitlisted before. So I'm like, well, let's see what happens with this. And just before the fall semester started, one of the other students decided that they actually wanted to go into a grad program somewhere else. And that left space for me to go into this graduate program that was actually, I learned later on, really competitive to get into. And so I found out that, you know, using all those same skills that I was hardworking, I was organized, I knew how to put things together and make meaning. And in my own way, I knew how to be successful based on previous experience. And so how I came to Cal State Fullerton is one of the assignments, my last year, so this was a three year graduate program. The last semester, one of our assignments was to update our resume with everything we've been doing on the graduate program and look for a, a position that you would want and tailor your resume to that position. The position that I used for that assignment is the position that I currently have now. I used the study abroad advisor application for that assignment, turned it in, and I got an interview, and that's how I ended up where I am today. And so in my current role, I always find myself that I'm always challenging myself. Everything is always scary. It's always a little different than something else I've done before, but because I kind of know how I operate, I think I know that I'm usually going to be okay. So being a SAGE advisor, but also University 100. So when I got a chance to interview and, and apply for University 100, the director said, are you okay teaching online? I said, yeah, I'm okay. I'm good. <laughs> Are you okay ta uh, teaching, uh, talking with students who might feel sad that this is how they're going to start, you know, their online, uh, their, their college experience? I said, mm, yeah, I got it. I'm good. And, and that's how it came to be. And so for me, lesson three was pay attention to your track record or to patterns about, you know, what were your successes? What are things that have happened to you? Because every day I come up to my husband going freaking out about some new thing that I've signed up for. And he goes, well, you did the other ones just fine. I was like, yeah, but this is different. It's like, but you've done the other ones fine. You're probably gonna do fine on this one. And so paying attention to kind of how you meet challenges, what you do with them, how you attack them, your skill set kind of matters. Okay. And then for lesson four, there are those times where you probably don't get things the way that you want them to be. So kind of remember that I was wait, wait listed for things more than once. And so I was like, what's, what's wrong with me that I'm always kind of waitlisted. I'm never the first one picked. Like, is there something wrong with me? Um, and then the second time that something kind of happened was I, while I was doing my graduate program, I was actually employed at Cal State Long Beach and I was doing a position that was fine and it was great and I was using my skills, but it wasn't the position that I wanted. I wanted to be a study abroad advisor. I wanted to send students abroad. And then a position finally opened up in the study abroad office and I applied and I was getting an interview and I was like, I've been working here. I've been a student assistant here, you know, and I thought, I was like, okay, I got, I'm, this is it. This is it. This is meant to be. And everyone else was kind of like, yeah, you know, winking in a sense. And it, like, they were kind of like, mm, all right. And I thought I was going to get it. And then I didn't. And I realized, you know, later on that, you know, when they say things like, it's about who you know, I knew the person, I knew them, they knew me. And sometimes those connections aren't enough. And I realized it was because I didn't do that well interviewing. I didn't give specific examples of the things that they, it was hard because like, we know you could do, but you didn't tell us how you were going to do it. And the person who did actually had a particular skill set that I didn't have as well at the time. And it has to do with our software. It's the software that we use. And I didn't know it as well as she did. And she knew it really, really well. And so what I did was I reached out to her. You know, I said, you know, hi, I'm Eileen. I work here. And, you know, congratulations. And, and I look forward because, you know, we still work really closely. And when we started to try to experiment with implementing that software, I reached out and I humbled myself and I said, can you show me how to do this? Can, can you teach me? And so she taught me everything she knew about this software. And to this day, I still use some of those skills that she taught me in my current role today, which leads me to lesson four, which is pay attention to the meaning that you give events in your life. Just because you're waitlisted doesn't mean that you're any less worthy for something. I did ask at one point, the graduate advisor at the time, I was like, you know, this happened. 
And they told me not to take it personally. It's because sometimes there's a, something that they're looking for that you may not be the fit at that moment or at that time. But how you tell yourself th that these things are happening matters and it can either go up or it can either go down. And so what I learned was that I never lose. I either win or I learn from that experience. I either learn the skill, I learn what I need to do, or I learn something about a situation so that I'm understanding when I don't get something or it doesn't go my way. And for lesson five, this kind of goes back to feedback. So, you know, the first example was my mom telling me, you know, kids listen to you. They, you know, you, when you say something like they like face you and their ears perk up, like no one else in our family does that. And my stepfather told me later that, you know, I was a bit unconventional and a bit and a bit of a maverick. I didn't know what those were at the time, but that just basically means that I don't conform to things very well or I, I think for myself. And a friend told me on Jet that I was very altruistic. Again, I didn't know what that was. And, you know, when I looked it up, it means that, you know, you give so much almost to that it it's at your disadvantage. And later on in my life, I had a, my, one of my grad professors tell me at the start of my second year, you know, you're a good writer. And he said it like it wasn't anything. He was looking at my assignment and just under his breath said, hmm, you're a good writer. And I said, excuse me, what? I'm a, I'm a good writer because I told myself that I wasn't, I didn't know. I didn't think I was, I just assumed that I wasn't a good writer because really when I was an English major back in Cal State Long Beach for my undergrad, my, my grades weren't that great. So I just always assumed that I was still a bad writer. And then later when I was talking to my professor again for a different situation, I was telling him, you know, when we have these classroom conversations, it's like, everyone else in the class looks at this one situation and says, hmm, the answer is A, B, C. But I'm over here thinking, I, I see D. And he asked me, he said, what's your, INF, what's your Myers-Briggs? Uh, in higher ed, we really like Myers-Briggs and personality tests. And I said, it said it was this. And he said, hmm, you might be an INFJ. And when I looked at it, I was like, oh, this is me. This, this, this helps me know what I'm good at and why things make sense to me in a different way than anybody else. And it turns out INFJs are like one or 2% of the population. And later on, when I was graduating and getting my master's, my grad advisor, they all had to say something kind about all of the students graduating. And my grad advisor for me said that my positive positivity and organization skills would make me a good leader that others would want to follow someday. And so for lesson five for everyone is pay attention to the good things that people say about you, because sometimes we have blinders on or we have blind spots that we're not paying attention to. I would have never known some of these things about myself if people didn't take the time to tell me. And so I like to pay that forward and tell people, did you know that you're really good at this? And most of the time the reaction is like, no, I didn't know. And I wish that we could share that with each other more often, because I think that we'd all feel better about ourselves, but we'd also find things that we're good at. And so when I put these things together and I started thinking about my narrative, I've been thinking about my narrative ever since that dark period when I came back from Japan and I didn't know what I was going to do. I picked up some career development book at Cal State Long Beach. It was like in the bargain bin. It was a random book that I think I Marie Kondoed. And, but it did ask like, what's your story? What is your narrative? And it, it made me ask myself, do I know my story well enough to tell it to somebody else? If it's an employer, if it's somebody who's interviewing me. And so for all these years, I've been kind of thinking about those moments that I shared with you in my life that helped me get to where I am today. It also helped that during grad school, I had a reflection based on writing a narrative, um, examining these kind of key points in my life. And the most important part about creating that narrative is understanding for me, how all of those lessons that I learned were connected. And I shared this recently in the class, if Marissa remembers, um, I came across a quote um, that's usually attributed to Buddha, that's that Buddha that says, you know, everything has beauty, but not everyone sees it. And I flipped it and I kind of said, you know, everything has purpose, but not everybody sees it, including those moments that you don't really feel good about. And so for me, I 
stumbled upon this description of my narrative really early on, I kind of linked all of those moments like they were beads, beads of different colors, beads of good moments and hardships and skills. And so all of those lessons that I shared with you are kind of my own little beads. Those, there are the beads where I've always been interested in this or I've been good at it. There are the beads of the people who influenced me in a particular way, those families, those teachers. There are these beads of you know my track record. Okay, what am I good at? And, and how have I been successful? And what can I learn from that? There are those beads of you know people telling me what I was good at. And then there are also those beads where things don't go your way or you know I have my fair share of sorrows and tragedies and how I chose to see them and make meaning of them and see the purpose in all of this. All these things have purpose. And I started connecting the dots and telling my story kind of like beads on a necklace or a thread until I created my narrative. And it all started to flow and make sense, kind of like how I'm presenting now. All of these things, like I said in the beginnings, like I didn't know what this picture was going to look like, but put together, it all makes sense. And so that's how I learned to construct and create my narrative. But then there comes the owning and the telling where I had to accept some of the things that happened to me, like being waitlisted and not being and feeling ashamed about that, not getting that job or having certain tragedies in my life, but realizing that that's all still part of the journey. Um, in terms of owning, there was a student who I was speaking to and it was a really, really great example of this kind of owning your narrative where the student kind of, you know, asked, said, do all the grades when I study abroad have to come back? I said, yes. And so she said, well, there's a class I didn't do very well in. I said, well, what happened? She said, well, I took a class that was really, really hard. And, you know, I thought I could do it and I didn't. And I kind of, and, and the student didn't feel very good about that moment and kind of wanted to hide. And I said, you know, what that tells me is you took a risk. And what I know about you is that, you know, I know that, you know, English may not be your first language. And so you took this even hard class and you challenged yourself more than you thought. And, you know, I would hope that you'd find a way to own that experience rather than, you know, look at it from a different way. That's why that reframing and, and, and how you make meaning out of something really matters because it could make you feel bad or it can make you feel really powerful. And then in the end, once we kind of own these parts, our journey, then we just kind of have to believe in ourselves enough to think that it's worthy of telling. So I wouldn't have maybe done this kind of presentation if it weren't for Tracy and Dimitri going, hey, we want people to tell us how they got to their jobs. And so I said, you know, why not? I think my story as, like I said, a CSU commuter student and how I landed basically in my dream job is worthy of telling. It might not be someone else's specific journey, but I hope that these lessons in between kind of help them navigate those things, how they find what they like, how to kind of ride through some of those harder moments that you know, you're not always gonna know what it's gonna look like, but if you follow your track record, think about what you're passionate about, the people who've influenced you, you'll kind of get there. And so, yeah, and so your story, as it says here, our story shouldn't be only worthy of telling because we have achieved something. Um, they should just be worthy of telling just because, you know, we're human. We have these stories and that's part of IEW is getting to know each other, getting to know each other's stories and celebrating all of these parts of us. And so my recap is to pay attention to the things that interest you and what you're naturally good at, to pay attention to who influenced you, to pay attention to your track record, even if you're waitlisted or you don't get it, your successes, your failures, how you respond to them, pay attention to the meaning that you've given some of those parts in your life and pay attention to the good things that people say about you. And so that's it. And so um, I'll take any, if anybody has any questions, but um, please feel free to check out the rest of International Education Week. The link is over there. And for any of the um, participants that are part of this um, uh, workshop, you'll be entered into a drawing today to possibly get your choice of either a tumbler, a visor, or a cap. And so that's it. So I couldn't see any of the chats. I've given like so many presentations this whole semester internationally and nationally, and this was the one that made me the most nervous. And so let me see what's, oh, the South Bay is so diverse. Yeah, great food, yay. Oh, Diego, yay, South Bay, hey. Thank you, everybody. Thanks so much. Was there any questions on anything? Oh, there's way more people <laughs> than when it started. Thanks for listening to my story, everybody. Yay.
I just want to thank you for sharing. I think um, I th one of the things that I hope is inspiring to students is sometimes you're told, hey, not yet, right? And how can you make yourself better prepared and equipped for when that opportunity comes up again or a different one does? And it seems mm -hmm. like you did that multiple times, um, didn't take it as a no and then was like, oh, I have to do something else. It's like, no, I'm still going to do this. I'm just going to find a different way to get there. So thank you for persevering and then just being a a lesson for all of our students and perseverance. Yeah. yeah, no problem. And I think I, I hope that you continue with this because I I'm sure, you know, there have probably been other stories that I haven't had the chance to hear. I'm sure we've got great, great faculty and staff and people with other stories that would be great to kind of find a way to hear more about them. A lot of my colleagues here have great stories. <laughs> so thanks again for the opportunity. All right, well, I'll stick around if anybody wants to chat. Thank you, Michaela. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Diego. Thank you, Yadira. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, everybody. I'm, I'm really happy that I got the support from the team here, too. Ah, Michaela is an INFJ. Hey, <laughs> feelers. Thank you, Marissa, for coming. Thank you, Michaela. Awesome. Well, this is the team. Tracy, we've got a lot of other great programming uh, this week. So I hope some of the students in Housing Residential will, will come and join us for them. Again, we're giving out um, uh, prizes and students can win more than once on um, if they win one day, they can go ahead and win another. So it'll be good for them to join. Yes, we added it to our um, newsletter, which we're waiting Perfect. for our director to do final approval, but it should go out tonight. So okay, cool. Yeah. Thank you. So they'll know. All right. Well, thank you so much. Have All a right. good evening. Bye. It was nice seeing you, Sheree. <laughs> nice seeing you too. <laughs> Oh, that was the hardest presentation I've ever done in my life. Oh. <laughs> I was so nervous. It was a lot. Oh my gosh. Oh my God, it was so hard to edit. I was like, I don't know what I'm doing, but this, this makes sense here. This is all true. Oh, I saw Bailey. Oh, we're still recording. Oh. <laughs> Shoot. Oh, um, I'll, I will find a way to take